this is Conspiranormal. All right, well, let's get started. Cool. All right, guys. Welcome back to Conspiracy Normal, everybody. Uh, first, I guess, official show episode of 2022. Bring on the double deuce. And uh, we're starting off strong. Um, we have a fan of the show on and someone that uh, knows what he's doing, knows what he's talking about. And we're going to talk about all that tonight. Steve Berg. Hi, thanks for having me on. This is really yeah. fun. Yeah, thanks for coming on, Steve. It's awesome, man. My pleasure. We've been uh, uh, talking a lot lately, and um, you know, I heard that you went on Banal of America not too long ago. Uh, <laughs> the kind of end of the year episode with him, and I got to call in and talk to you then. So yeah, that was great. It was really cool, and uh, found that you're like a fan of the show, but uh, you. Got a pretty impressive resume yourself. I mean, let's kind of talk <laughs> about about you and some of like the shows that you've been on, and things that you've done for a little bit. You've been on well, Bob's Burgers. You're oh yeah, there, yeah, yeah, correct? yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. No, I've I've been uh, lucky enough to do a decent amount of voiceover, and let me tell you, it is kind of the greatest because you can just kind of roll up in there, no lines memorized, in sweatpants, like looking like hell, feeling like hell, and just go knock it out and one hour <laughs> it's great well i guess it's pretty easy to do now right especially when you don't have to i guess you don't really have to go now with covid and everything you don't get you don't have to go to the studio so you can i guess do it from home i guess well so. i've done you know i've done very little from home because the recording like specifications are so high and it's right. i think it's hard for them to match everyone's home recording you know it's like uh so it is still like people are still going to the studio so i it just it, it's just been i mean like my line of work has been very slow since the pandemic started. Like, hmm. even though they're shooting stuff, it's really precious little. You know, like, it's just kind of like the priority shows, the big banner shows for networks. And uh, so it's, you know, it's still, like, weird, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, super, super weird. But uh, it's not all bad in terms of uh, a lot of things. You know, it's kind of given me uh, some time to get into some research of my own into this stuff, which I've always, like, been always wanting to do as opposed to just being a guy who, you know, absorbs and, uh, you know, consumes other stuff and books and podcasts. But I've been actually, you know, kind of getting out there myself and uh, try to <laughs> poke around a little bit. It's been quite, quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I noticed you've kind of been making the rounds lately on some of the podcasts. And that's why I was like, well, hey, you know, perfect first guest for, for for this year or so and uh drunk history i think is another one that you've been involved yeah with. i've done a bunch of drunk history um actually uh yeah Derek waters who created that show is like a really great buddy of mine I actually just got the phone with him about 20 minutes ago and um i'm actually going back to out to la in a few weeks to go work on a new project of his but uh yeah drunk history is been a great show for me i've had so much fun doing it and uh you know it's kind of one of those shows where i'm working with all my buddies like I've kind of like, you know, you know, made my way in LA to the, the alternative comedy scene, which was a lot of kind of like, you know, like non-traditional club comedy, kind of like, you know, sketches and improv and just kind of like storytelling weirdo stuff. Uh, and a lot of the people who are in Drunk History are kind of my crew from, you know, back in the day. So it's like really cool. just going to bullshit with friends, you know, and then, you know, get paid and be on a TV show. Did it they film haven't they filmed some of Drunk History here in Nashville? Is it that Oh yeah, I gosh, I can't remember. I know like back in the first few seasons, they kind of did themed by region, and I think they did a whole Nashville episode. Yeah, okay. I gotta I think, think they that's what I, that's it might have been the Dolly Parton ep or that's that that's it. Yeah, yeah. which is on which is a great Casey Wilson and Dolly Parton is great in uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, God, I would love to talk. I could talk about Nashville for a while. I absolutely love Nashville. Love Nashville. Well, thank you. And people have probably seen you in other stuff, uh, in acting roles, and then you're also a writer, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mostly write um, stuff geared towards television. Like nothing I've ever written has appeared on TV. I mean, I've, I've written like jokes for things and stuff like that, but I've sold, uh, you know, a number of uh, television shows, ideas, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, I'm always pitching shows, like, you know, I'm getting ready to pitch a show, I think, probably in early February and stuff. So, yeah, and I've always tried to, like, you know, fuse in uh, my weird 40 and love of that stuff 
But that's yeah. always like the first the first note I was getting. They're like, yeah, maybe take that stuff out. And, oh, uh, shit. <laughs> well, how does that work? Because it seems it doesn't work well. Yeah. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, it seems like the you know Fortiana and, and kind of this, these weird subcultures are mined for Hollywood stuff that we see a lot later on. But is that just kind of a really slow process? It's kind of a slow process. I kind of think that, you know, if you start from like the 1950s, like, you know, Flying Saucers, Day the Earth Stood Still, you know, laying on the lawn, I think it was really basic. And, you know, and, and even then it kind of, you know, echoed what the contactees were reporting. It was kind of like, you know, clean up your act, save the planet. And it was really environmental, <laughs> environmentally based yeah. back in the 50s before it was hip to be a a climate change supporter in a yeah, fear of nuclear war too. Yeah. Oh, at, oh totally. Yeah. You're absolutely right. The cold war was, I mean, it was, yeah, just, you know, it was metaphorically all over the place with that. And, um, and then, you know, kind of the threat narrative, like with, you know, the eighties action and stuff like that. So I'm kind of hoping that, I mean, the reality is Hollywood is like, I work in Hollywood, a lot of my checks come from Hollywood studios and stuff like that. But I feel so distant from it in terms of like the stuff I consume. I'm not like much of a popcorn movie guy at all, you know. So when I when I want to watch entertainment, I usually watch documentaries about weird stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things too. Like you know, once you learn how the sausage is made, you know, yeah. you want you want anything but that. <laughs> Well, speaking of like paranormal cable, do you ever think it's going to evolve into something that's a little more sophisticated, maybe without sounding like an ass? That's, you know, okay. Well, I just, um, I shot a pilot right, right before COVID uh, for a show that was kind of like that. It was more like kind of a sociological look into the people who love Fortiana and kind of love like weird ideas and outsider culture. Yeah. And it was a real uphill battle. But I ended up selling it and got to shoot a pilot. But then I still haven't pitched the show because right when I was done with it, the pandemic happened. So I don't know if my show is going to be the show. But, like, you know, that is what my hope is. I'm, con I'm, you know, if it's not this show, I have another idea for a show that is more Fortiana based as opposed to just like, we're going to find the truth about aliens or, you know, mm -hmm. ghosts, uh, this ghost in the house and someone's dead granny. Like, rednecks and Bigfoot. Yeah, you know, none of that stuff is, it's so tired and boring, and I don't think there's any evidence or validity to really any of it, you know, like, I, I'm I'm such a Fortean in um, my interest, and I don't want to say belief system, but just what I'm into is weird stuff, like, you know, I think um, when I was a really little kid, you and I were talking about Twin Peaks right before we started recording, right, mm -hmm. and I was, God, I was pretty damn young, I want to say I was like, in you know 12 when that came out and my mom like for some reason like pulled me and goes hey i think you're gonna like this show we watched the pilot together and my life changed but that instilled this sense when i watched twin peaks i knew what i loved in this world and that was surrealism yeah because right after twin peaks i was like oh i need more so then i watched every david lynch movie then i started watching kubrick movies and i discovered what excites me more than anything is weird stuff that doesn't make sense or doesn't have a clear cut meaning. And I, even prior to that, since I was a really little kid, I had been into UFOs and like ghosts and Bigfoot, you know, I had the time life books when I was like seven, you know, like, so I was always a weird kid like that, but twin peaks kind of crystallized my love, the surreal for the surreal. And that's really what Fortiana is to me. It's just surrealism that might have some truth to it. And so, you know, like, it's kind of like one of those things. I think when you're into it, it's like, you never get out of it. I, I don't know any, you know, anyone who's like really into UFOs and all of a sudden one day they're like, I'm done with it. I, you know, no interest anymore. It just kind of, I think it kind of like just intensifies over one's life. But sorry, long winded. Do I ever think paranormal cable television will get more sophisticated? I would have said no. And then I saw, I, I, I know people have different opinions, maybe, but I loved Hellier. Like, Hellier to me was, like, wildly sophisticated. It's kind of, and, and you know, when anytime a documentary series is talking about, you know, Jacques Vallée and Jean Keel and, you know, like, Rebirth of Pan, I'm like, what? You can do that? You know, like, it kind of, like, and I think because they worked out of any kind of studio system or network, mm -hmm. they just said, you know what, fuck it. We're going to, like, just kind of make what we wish we could watch. 
And to me, yeah. that kind of spirit is what I'd love to see more going forward. And and I don't really know if cable companies or like production companies will ever fully like get get on board for that. I kind of have my doubts about that. Well, but that's... what they showed is that you can just fucking do it, man. Like they did it for no money, you mm-hmm. know. Like right. As as big as Hellier has been, I guess amongst our circles and even outside of it. Really, it doesn't seem that the. I mean, I I, I don't know if there was a hope public, that the right. that Hollywood or I don't know Hollywood is not the next the right term. Television would pick up, uh, would pick up on it. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it's been it's been three years at this point, and they still haven't really they still haven't really picked up on it. So I don't know whether they wanted they had the the hope that it would happen, but. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Like, it was much more um, realistic to the point of like how things could actually actually be, and it wasn't really uh, it wasn't as sensational, I think, as a lot of this like television stuff is. Right, right. And, and the thing about that show, I guess, even just from like a uh, production standpoint and just from like a critical standpoint, I think whether you actually, even if you know, if you're into this kind of like subject matter, I think whether you actually liked. Hellier or not, um, I think you can appreciate what they did because it is as a person who's you know been making my own stuff since I was like sixteen and you know doing stuff professionally. It is so 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 hard to do something, and especially it's so hard, even harder to do something of quality. And they did it for no money, you know, like and it took them a long time. And mm-hmm. it, what people don't understand is they put in hundreds of hours of sifting through that footage and crafting like a good story and to me just as like as art i think hellier is wonderful like so i mean like in in i just in, i enjoy the journey quite a bit so yeah i i actually i do have hope that en- people will see that and say like man you know you know hellier is what we can aim for you know it doesn't even have to be that good but i think more independently uh produced stuff into fortiana is what i'm really interested in well, and well, in fact, well, what also- i'm trying to do myself you know like also, too, Seth Breed loves stuff. I Absolutely, think is just, just just as equally important. Agreed. And I mean, he doesn't. Uh, I mean, he sticks to really to the facts. He sticks to the witnesses. Um, you know, I mean, you know, he makes it. He and, he and he makes it entertaining at the same time. Right. Right. And, and there's a real art to kind of. Um, and I think you know those two two are great examples of taking. People like us who are really into this stuff, and, and you know, I guess just for uh, just for example, like we 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 would all have maybe master's degree in Fortiana, right? So he kind of the, both those things kind of uh, it, at least for me, like I find it very impressive how I think like a Seth Breedlove movie could be interested even to somebody who's mildly interested in this stuff, and interesting to people who are really into this stuff, and that is a balance I'm like really interested in finding. Um, myself because if i was ever you know if i'm ever wanting to go out and uh you know document some of this stuff for video or write a book or whatever i would want to talk about the stuff i'm interested in and yeah the stuff i'm interested in is you know keely and valley and and you know uh i mean the the podcast you guys have done with timothy renner and josh cutchen are some of my favorites like they take me they're, they're to me like as i'm getting older i'm getting more interested in kind of folksy fortiana where it's like small town stuff just around you, you know, like, and that's another thing Hellier got me excited about. Like when I, I moved back to Nebraska during the pandemic to uh, be closer to my parents. And I have found, found out that like Eastern in Nebraska, especially has so, a history of so much crazy shit that I kind of knew there was a, a decent amount of stuff, but like I, there's Helliers everywhere, you know, like, I mean, yeah, like, that's, right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when you scratch the surface, you're like, oh my God. You know, like. And I think that goes back to what you're talking about with Twin Peaks, because that's really what Twin Peaks is about. And yep. the way that Lynch is able to translate high strangeness and really like convey that surrealism is something that, you know, is the only way to do it. 
Yeah, uh, he was he was able to, but it's it's not easy to convey that because it's not like a bunch of dudes in the woods and then the, a light or screaming and you know like the visually it's hard. You have to find ways to convey stuff. Um, that's hard with a lot of the high strangeness. Uh, you know when you're trying to turn things like that into documentaries because a lot of it ends up being people just standing around and talking and that doesn't get a lot of people's attention. It, it, you're so right. And that is the trick because like, you know, I, I remember for instance, I did like a drunk history and you know, they're like, Hey, you, you want to do one this year? And I was like, yeah, let me do the Roswell story because yeah, I know I don't watch. It's great. Yeah. Oh, thanks. I like, I know we've pitched a bunch of like UFO type stuff. They're like, yeah, that really doesn't have like a, they're like, yeah, it's not like a big enough historical thing, but everyone knows Roswell. So I'm like, How, come on. And so they let me do Roswell. And to me, I just like said it was Project Mogul because one, I was kind of like enjoyed like pissing off Roswell. <laughs> like I'm so tired of Roswell. Like I just actually don't <laughs> like it, <laughs> you know? So I was, I really like, in, you know, loved saying it was Project Mogul. And that was, I, that was just kind of something I said, but like people were pissed at me. That wasn't the first time I ever experienced. You pretty much just said there was no aliens. <laughs> and, and I don't believe there was. I mean, like, I mean, like to believe that I, I just, I would need to see more than Don Schmidt's evidence, you know, yeah, like, yeah, or, right. you know, like, I mean, you know, I think something happened, but like, I think what Nick Redfern is sniffing around at is probably more logical, you know, right. and much more believable to me, I guess, but I would love it to be aliens, but you know, show me, show me something. Show me something. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, did it uh, just as an aside? Didn't Drug History do something on Jack Parsons too? Yes, they Are absolutely did. That? I was not. You know, I, I think you know Duncan Trussell is. He, I mean, he, you could almost call him a Fortean comedian. Like he's very into esoterica in a major way. Like he's kind of like he, he's a friend of mine too, and he is kind of like. Gosh, I hate to b build him up too much. Kind of like an Alan Watts figure. Like he is the closest to a mystic I've ever met in my life. Like for like truly, truly. And um, he did the Alan Parsons. Uh, he also did a Timothy Leary one. So he's always kind of like the esoteric guy, even like more so than me. He he kind of has the dark arts covered, <laughs> you know. So uh, I'm more of a the UFO nerd, I think, in that in that family. So yeah. even if like a lot of people like you who are creatives and, and writing and acting and things like this, even if these things don't directly make their way into material in a real obvious way, do you think that just being interested in this stuff can be kind of like a, a catalyst of a creative engine to lead to all kinds of other ideas? Absolutely. It can. I, I, I've, I've done like a lot of punch up work and even just punch up work for friend scripts and a lot of what I do will just make occult jokes or, you know, just like weird references to like, you know, a crop circle or something like that, or, you know, just in, in, in people generally like that because a lot of the people I work with are like comedian, com you know, comedy people, and they just ha don't know anything about that. So for them, I'm sort of a valuable asset in a very specific niche way. Because you're bringing that authenticity to whatever. Yeah, they're like, "Hey, you want to weird up your script? Give it to Berg, and he'll he'll do it." You know? <laughs> like, <laughs> so, and I, you know, I feel like I, I that's actually something I can offer. So I've always been a person when I'm when I'm writing stuff, I kind of stick to what I know, and what I know is a decent, a good amount, about forty on it, and outsider culture because that's been my lifelong passion. So. While it may not be the most lucrative in terms of like, you know, big deals and like, you know, selling TV shows that actually make it to, onto the air, I've been able to have like, you know, a nice career and be able to like, you know, keep on trying to do this stuff. I'll always try to like, you know, infuse as much Fortiana into everything I do as possible. It's just, you know, <laughs> I'm told to dial it back quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, no one knows what you're talking about, man. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> fair. I, I think they would be surprised. Yeah, I at, at, at this point in time, I mean, just from what I think, all these kind of like established, um, kind of gatekeeping TV or whatever, like they they they're slow to to hit a trend. They are, and then and then. The thing is, they'll they'll find a trend, and then everyone will do it, and only one or two can be successful. And then the trend is like gone. They're like, well, we can never do Fortiana again because it right. didn't work out for us. I mean, that's the thing about you know, that's kind of the tragic thing about Hollywood. It's like one person has a you know, like you know, like that. Show, I, I don't, I haven't seen it, but like that show Ted Lasso is super big, and so agents and managers be like, you need to write something like Ted Lasso, and I'm like, 
but that's not who mm-hmm. I am. You know, I don't, I don't know how to do that, <laughs> but they're like, okay, anyways, but that's what people want to buy. I'm like, right. Because by that's the time what- I write it, everyone's going to have already done that. So it just, yeah. Just like music or anything else. Yeah. I've sort of come to this, like, I've sort of made my peace in a way in this, not to sound cynical, but like, I am determined to kind of like, and I don't want to say side hustle because that sounds like I'm in it for the money, but like, I definitely want to start dedicating a portion of my creative like time to doing projects in this stuff because Mm -hmm. I enjoy it so much. (laughs) You know, I just love it. To me, it's like a way of adventuring and just like driving to a small town in Nebraska where supposedly a Bigfoot braided a World War II flag. I, that is like how I want to spend my days. So I feel like I'm going to start just like, you know, and I don't even say, I feel like I've shot a bunch of these videos and I'm just going out and like basically taking a selfie stick and telling the story of what happened in this small town. And I don't know, maybe nine people will watch it, but I am having a ball doing it. Just love it. Love it. Love it. So yeah, I feel like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, I don't want to fight, you know, like production companies and networks forever on the kind of stuff I want to do. I think instead, maybe I'll just go do it. And then maybe if I have any success in that, they'll put it on TV. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good strategy because a lot of times people have to see it before, you know. I agree. And I think something like this, people would have to see. Because when I'm trying to explain like ultra terrestrials to people at NBC, they're like, they're like, <laughs> they'll call my manager and say, like, dude, tell your client to not do so much acid before he <laughs> comes into the office. <laughs> like, you know, like, and you know, I, I've, I've had those notes before from people. <laughs> they're like, but, Gee, this guy's crazy. There was one show that I really liked, you know, I guess after the initial Ghost Hunters, because I thought the first season of Ghost Hunters was really good. You know, because it was much more, I guess, quote unquote, realistic, if you can call it that. But like uh, Ghost Stalkers, the one that John Tinney did, that was only like six episodes long. Where do you was, find that? I don't know if you can find it now. Uh, I bet Tinney can send it out to me. He, yeah, he probably could. I mean, it, but I don't, I'm not sure if they even show it anymore. I, I think a couple of years after the, I think 2014 was when it came out. So. I remember seeing reruns in about two or three years after, but I don't think you can anymore. But it was only six episodes long. But I thought that, you know, the way that they did it was interesting and that it was just they didn't have a camera crew. They shot just one per. They had one person with the handheld camera, kind of like what you're talking about. And they would just see what their experiences were. But then Tenny himself just lent so much to the show and just his ideas were just way ahead of everybody else's ideas, at least from the ideas that were being, you know, translated to the medium, I guess. Dude, I, I love that guy. Like, to me, he's like, I, I'm like, a, I guess I'm on the young spectrum. I'm like the very end or very end of Generation X, I think. And anyways, a lot of my heroes are Gen X dudes of his generation. And to me, like, yeah, he's here. such a legend man like i've never met him but i've sort of like formed like i mean i don't know maybe maybe he wouldn't consider i consider a online friendship <laughs> um with him and it, it just i think he is i he's so poetic he's like the poet laureate of fortiana to me like he's able to take these very complex ideas and he could explain to your grandma and your grandma would understand which i i i, I he, obviously he's a very sharp brilliant person with a mastery of the english language but i find him such an impressive dude you know like um well he's also i mean he's not only with the fortiana and the supernatural stuff but i mean he's also you know very knowledgeable about all the conspiracy theory and all the uh you know the the assassinations of the 60s and all this type of stuff that he's like i mean he's Kennedy assassination. I mean, he's knowledgeable about all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't realize that that that's kind of like the other side of Tenny. Right, right. Well, he's kind of like, you know, th- from what I, you know, and from what I gather, he's kind of like one of those old school left wing conspiracy theorists. Yeah, he is. Or guy, not not that he is one himself, but he's a historian of that. Almost like kind of Ken Thomas. I almost would throw in that camp too because I think Ken yeah. Thomas is a, kind of a lefty himself, you know? Um, and there's a guy that actually really inspired Tinny, his mentor, Craig Ciccone. I should give him a shout out. 
you've probably heard him on this show but Tenny hooked me up with him and as far as i know no one else has ever had him on their their shows but he's extremely knowledgeable yeah yeah and it's in and, and it's a you know i don't know it's just and that was a more interesting uh conspiracy theory time i guess because it was still like underground or i don't know maybe i'm just like an old man harkening back to the old days but uh that's what we do all the time anyway so yeah it just it. it didn't seem so so poisonous as it is now like i think it was i think it still was you probably, but, right. You're probably um, there right. was this and i'm guilty of it too you know there was this uh playful kind of disconnect of real world consequences there's this discordian type of play amongst a lot of people who were you know self-identified as like uh left wing or libertarian types yeah um but still the origins of a lot of those memes were very fucked up uh extreme right wing stuff and it was the actual strategy of those right wing forces at the time to build alliances around conspiracy theory with left wing types. Yeah, right. And they pretty much the way we look at it now, I'm like, holy shit, they won. Like this yeah. is the whole point. Yeah. And well, so, yeah, it seems like there's been strategies in place going back a long time uh, that I definitely do not understand. <laughs> That's why I mostly stick to, to uh, Fortiana stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. It's impossible to kind of like keep it totally out of it, though, because there's no, a lot of cross pollination. Right. Oh, there, there. I mean, God damn, there totally is. I mean, in, in like, it's always been that way. You're definitely right. And it's, I mean, like, and it still is today. You know, like, there is like a, you know, I, I don't really like, you know, wander around the UFO Twitter scene very much. But if yeah. you if you dip it's your not toe good for your health, it, God, it is absolutely not. Like it is just what a gross. It, it's gross to me. Like I don't like. It, it, it seems. I mean, and I know. I guess again, I'm sounding like an old man, but like we have been here before. Yeah, and I cannot believe everyone just biting on this stuff and getting so excited about something Lou Elizondo says. I mean, like, I, like I, I, I'm interested in about it for like. 72 seconds and then i'm bored i stopped reading the article <laughs> right you know it really is it's crazy which is like the same deal with conspiracy theory like we're just going through so many recycled memes and for anyone who's been interested in this stuff for decades it's like oh yeah this you know greatest hits yeah but yep. i think yep. now i think now it's 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 it probably is it, different like it's, it's never been this mass uglier. yeah yeah well it's never social, been this adopted it's been, by it's been weaponized yeah, yeah. well so, social media has just turned it into turned a prairie fire into like this like just started the, scorched the earth you know yeah because like, i mean it is like I mean, it, you know, I, I worried that like conspiracy theory and all this like misinformation is going to lead to like societal collapse. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, yeah. at a certain point, this is the kind of stuff you have to be concerned about. If there's no shared narrative, no shared understanding, I mean, then there's really no central culture at all. Yeah. Uh, I was revisiting Robert Guffey's Crypto Scatology. Which what is, is that book? It's a book about uh, he, it, the subtitle is Conspiracy Theory is Art Form. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he's just kind of, it's a collection of essays where he's talking about all this kind of weird cultural stuff and conspiracy theories. Really, really great. Just check it out. Uh, but he, he talks in one of those chapters about the relationship between uh, conspiracy theory and comedians and how many comedians since Lenny Bruce have been, you know, into conspiracy theory and his like yeah. takes on why that might be because right. you guys like finding patterns or finding things you know, finding weird angles to things that most people would just overlook, or I guess that applies to the Fortiana stuff too. Uh, yeah, that is, God, that is a really interesting point. I mean, if you, you could, the, probably the, one of the great, I mean, well, the two greatest examples that I think of right away are George Carlin and Bill Hicks, right? Like yeah. they, I mean, like to say they were card carrying conspiracy theorists. I don't know if you could say that, but like their comedy was con very conspiracy driven. They're yes. basically, they're basically, they're, they're, theme was you're being lied to you're being fucked over yeah Open up your fucking eyes you know like and that is kind of like but they were talking about it in a very high art intellectual way like like those two guys could do who are, i think are both fantastic um but then you get some of these dipshits trying to like talk about the same ideas they had i'm like you guys are so dumb <laughs> you're missing the point yeah you're not like you're not george carlin but. yeah and also like george carlin a lot of times was not being literal 
you yeah. know, he was using comedy as a way for you to understand these kind of complicated ideas. Same with Bill Hicks, for sure. And a lot of these guys are taking what they say. And that, and that is the thing with comedy nowadays. Like, I have a lot of friends who are still touring comedians. God bless them. And do you know how hard it is to be a comedian nowadays with, like, what you can say, what you can't say? But it's but, more it's more than that. More than, like, kind of, like, the, you know, worrying about offending anyone is people taking you literally. Mm -hmm. Like, satire and parody and being sarcastic is where like is the comedy engine but you can be on stage and say like you know just like you know like wh whatever and be sarcastic and it, people used to understand oh it's sarcasm he's using that as an example to shine light on racism or hate nowadays people would be like oh my god like you can't impersonate a dumb redneck and say you something can't that, no yeah. you can't to and make like, fun it, of the redneck but ex exactly be like oh my god this comedian you know what? he's actually a redneck and he hates people and he's anti semitic you're like no 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 i'm lampooning these people yeah. as an example of how fucking stupid they are people don't people don't realize it's character yeah the nuance is a I, little bit tough i think nowadays i know i know this is controversial but i mean what is what you're saying there i mean like is Dave Chappelle and what's going on with him? Is that kind of a good example of this? No, I don't think it really is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, Cause he was really like saying his own opinions. He wasn't really, he was saying his own opinions. And I mean, like, you know, guys, you could get into a long debate about, you know, whether you think people morally have a right to, when they have an audience as big as his to, you know, gosh, I, you know, and like that, that is the thing. Like, you know, I actually don't know. Like I, I, I'm like a lot of people think Dave Chappelle's a genius. You know, he, he is a legend. I, I think he's, I think he's very much like in the vein of Lenny Bruce. He is, he is. I like, do I love some of his choices he's made in his material? I don't. I just actually just don't think it's funny. I think it's kind of weak material for him and a little bit easy and not yeah. as cerebral as I always, you know, as I expect a guy like him to be. That, yeah. So that's more what I, I take offense to. It's like, well, damn, your jokes just aren't funny, too. It's like, at a certain point, I'm not the one to censor people. Mm -hmm. People can say whatever the fuck they want. But, like, I think also, you know, if I'm Netflix, I don't know if I want, you know, I mean, like, you know, they have the right to also, to, they're a company. They're not, you know, part yeah. of the government. They, and they didn't. They actually defended him, by the way. But if they want to, like, throw his, like, his special off the air, that's their right. I mean, like, it's actually the same argument. So uh, this stuff, I think sensory, censoring art or censoring anything is a slippery slope. And we're going to, I don't know what we're going to do. We're in such tricky times. There's like no right answer. To but yeah, the response to, you know, the response to the, what people say is the political correctness is this like canned edginess that's like really fucking old too and kind of like what we're talking about these people who, yes. who think they're being george carlin they think that you know but like they're not and they're feeding into a lot of really like terrible shit and like i mean i've seen with that dave Chappelle special you know him like get a lot of like thumbs up from people that he probably doesn't want to like make this kind of weird alliance with right. you know it's yeah. like right. you guys probably disagree on everything else except for what you what you feel about trans people you know you're it's right like, and i think a lot of those people actually aren't even understanding what the joke he's trying to make right right they're not you know probably as like nuanced as him and it's just yeah. like yeah yeah, it's, you know, it's like, like everything in art and like everything out there, it's like everything is like very scrutinized right now. So it's really like, you know, like right now, Patton Oswalt, who I, I know a little bit and he's just a great comedian, you know, really a kind of a living legend in, in terms of stand-up comedian. And he did, um, he did a little guest spot on New Year's Eve with Chappelle. And he sent out like an Instagram saying like, oh, it was great to see my old buddy and come do like 20 minutes on a show, blah, blah, blah. And then people like just destroyed him the next day saying like, how could you, you do a show when you preach all these kind of like, you know, uh, no hate types of things. And I'm like, I, guys, you're attacking the wrong person. Like, this is not where we should put, be putting our energy into Pat and Oswald. You know, like there is enough problems in the world. You know, I don't know, you know. A person who occupied some similar positions and probably even like worse was uh, Dick Gregory. I mean, like he was used 
mm-hmm. by the fucking Liberty Lobby, by like really extreme right wing people because he was into like some of the conspiracy theory shit. He's and I mean, on Alex Jones a lot. Yeah. And I mean, but th- there's a historical precedent of, of certain elements of like black nationalists yep. with white supremacists or really right wing people trying to find some common separatist cause bullshit and stuff like that. But I mean, he was really like, you know, you, I feel like he was used and like, what did he benefit from any of that shit? But you know, good point. And I actually didn't know that Dick Gregory was on, was actually on Alex Jones show. That seems crazy. I mean, he's got a, he's got a long history with the LaRussians, with the Liberty Lobby. Really? I did not know that. I had no idea. I didn't know that either till he told me, but I mean, when you really sit down and think about it, it kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because there's a lot of, you know, fucked up social and reactionary positions that all kinds of people have. But all I knew Dick Gregory is being someone that was very for civil rights. Yeah. Oh, yeah. he was absolutely pro civil rights. But yeah, it yeah. seems like maybe he was, you know, I don't know. That, that is that is an interesting uh, intermingling right there. Right. Which I, I worry about Dave Chappelle. Like, he, does he want to be this poster child for like really, you know, fucked up people? It's like, it's not a good. Yeah. Not a good, I, right. Who knows, man? Yeah. It's, you know, either way, but, he'll be, he'll be yeah. just fine personally. <laughs> then again, you know, like, you know, people were saying, oh, this cancel culture, blah, blah, blah. But he's still selling out arenas. Like, there's this alternative media that's still thriving that, you know. Oh, he'll be just fine. Yeah. yeah. So it's almost like it creates this it, so much more energy for this like alternative media that then goes like further to the extreme and just kind of like continues this culture war shit that we were going through. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, I watched the I watched the latest special and like I, I think I, I agree with you, Steve. I didn't think it was that funny. No, but yeah, I, I but I thought you know the whole time I was watching it, it was just like he really feels the need to address this. And he does. Like, I, it's it's like he gets kind of uncomfortable. He, he has like, said before, like, okay, I'm not going to address it anymore, and then he addresses it again. And and the, and the thing is, he's just not crafting like high caliber jokes with it. You know, it'd be one thing if he was making this wonderful example and like using it as a way to like shine a light on people who are intolerant. But like, I'm not sure what his point is. <laughs> It's not funny. It seems muddled and confused. And I'm, I'm like, did he just not workshop this on the road at all? Like, I, I don't know. You know, like, and that's the thing. It's like, and also, I'm not it is, as much as I've worked in comedy. I am. I don't. I have rarely consumed comedy. Like, it, it, so, but I, I, you know, Chappelle's one of those people where, you know, you usually check out the new Chappelle special. And yeah, I don't know. This, this one sure got attention, though. You know, <laughs> it's not going to be bad for his career. Trust me. Yeah. Are you from Nashville? Uh, no, I like half and half. I've been here since I was 12 and 95, but I'm originally from Phoenix area. So, okay, cool, cool, yeah. cool, cool. Southwestern and Southeastern. Do you guys notice a lot of LA people there? I know it. Fuck yeah, dude. Please tell them to stop. I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, it's not my fault, but yeah. uh, I know, especially, especially during um, COVID, I knew a, I had a, like a handful of friends who were like, I'm fucking going to Nashville, dude. <laughs> like, fuck LA, man. They're like, <laughs> Yeah, it used a to be a, got out. Used to be a, a affordable place to live, but sure no, it's affordable. Live. Even like Omaha, fucking Nebraska, dude, is like. What are they moving there for? They got a little hip hip side of town. Oh yeah, I mean, like, there's a whole like big indie rock record label scene here, and Alexander okay, Payne, cool. the director, like, let's see. I mean, there there's a pretty big artist culture here. You know. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a nice place to live. I, I really like. Does it have like a? Like a Western flavor or, or a nah, kind of thing? Omaha is like a pretty like progressive little city, you know, city. It's got like a million people. So it's, you know, not small. And uh, but outside of Nebraska, if you like go five miles out of Nebraska, it is fucking like just different, dude. It's a Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the right wing Taliban, dude. Like, you know, for a while I was like driving out and like going to like, you know, different like high. high are, are we recording again? I'm sorry. Yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. But for a while I was like driving out to, uh, when I first moved here, um, you know, I like work was basically like off. So I'm like, well, Hey, here's an opportunity to like go look at weird stuff. So I was like driving out to Ashland, Nebraska, uh, where the Herbert Shermer police officer was abducted in 1967. It's a case I love, but I was driving around with the California plates still. 
And oh, you're from around here, are you, boy? Well, people would like get on my the tail of my car, and I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" Like, I'm like, "Man, it's like this is dangerous." <laughs> but in Omaha, it was like no problem. People didn't care, you know. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, outside of Omaha and like Lincoln, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty serious, man. Well, you can tell us more about weird Nebraska then, since it seems like you're really delving into the oh, small I'm, town I, weird. I, what's, what's going on in Nebraska? Because there's a lot of people that the debate whether Nebraska actually exists, <laughs> like Jataria. That might be that if that's actually a conspiracy theory, that might be my favorite. It's like birds. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible, dude. Birds aren't birds aren't real, right? Is that is that a conspiracy theory? Oh, there's a well. There's a. I think uh, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's. Oh my god! <laughs> but it, it's a joke. But only 25 million Americans believe it. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. There. There is a website called Birds yeah. Aren't Real and a Twitter handle called Birds Aren't Real, that, that says that birds are actually surveillance drones. I, I think it might have actually been that birds were actually all killed off and replaced with surveillance drones. I think. Oh my god! <laughs> the, the the thing is like conspiracy theories like that used to be so fun. They were like bits you would do with friends. Like, what's the most ridiculous thing? Oh, yeah, right. And right. now, all of a sudden, there's like a Facebook group about it. Like, you actually, these birds, these killer birds are going to fuck us all. You know, like, <laughs> it's... <laughs> well, one of, the best, one of the best conspiracy theories I ever heard was that Morgan Freeman was actually J- Jimi Hendrix. He just faked his death as Jimi Hendrix and became. That's great. That's great. Or Marilyn Manson was Paul from the Wonder Years. That was a good one, too. (laughs) (laughs) I remember when I first heard that and I was pretty young. I was like, shit, is that true? I I can, you know, I think I can see it. (laughs) Uh, That's good. Okay. Well, so in terms of Nebraska, um, you know, well, there, there, there's a handful of sort of like, I guess, quasi famous ones that you guys, the Herbert Shermer case is definitely like a big one. There was a, Unsolved Mysteries about it as a kid, which I was very excited. Refresh my memory on that. Um, it would happen in 1967. You know, that was kind of, I think, before the big early 70s flap. But there was a lot of things happening around there. It's kind of like, the, you know, jeez, uh, that might have been the same. I think it was Summer of Love. I think it was the same time as uh, all stuff in Point Pleasant was happening. A lot of the Keel books take place in this era. Anyway, um, Herbert Shermer was a police officer. He was like a war hero in the Korean War. And he was in his early 20s and everyone in town loved him. And he was at like, I think at two in the morning doing his like a uh, little beat. He was checking out the gas station. This is a very small little town, especially back then. And he comes across the junction of 66 and 6, 666. Oh, and he sees okay. a right. like fireball that looks like a football, like hovering above this junction. And so he gets closer and then the thing lands and it's got like kind of like a rocket, you know, propulsion and uh but it is like saucer shaped and they they get off and they they're like what did they call him they they call him the uh uh uh, the not the lawman whatever they they that you know entities come to his window they have a conversation they have like a little wand and then like you know he goes back to the police station this whole encounter happens it's kind of fuzzy in his head and he you know tell you know he, he notices he's missing time and then um, the town, like, hears about this. And, you know, it's a small little town. And they go fucking bonkers. Like, the church is saying, like, he's, like, a, you know, like, part demon. The kids in the town make an effigy of him. And they hang it in the middle of the town. Supposedly, I don't know if this is actually true, they blew up his uh, civilian car with dynamite. So this poor guy ends up changing his name and moving and uh, I think he ended up moving to Bellevue, Nebraska, and then living out his life. And he, he like, he regretted it and all this, all this stuff. And I, I, he actually, he passed away a couple of years ago, but I met his two brothers. I went to Ashland this summer and his two brothers came back for like, you know, Ashland days, whatever. They're having like a little summer festival. And I talked to him and what they told me that, which I thought was very interesting. And none of the other literature has this is that him and his two brothers and his father, who was a military guy had a really dramatic, like flying saucer, sighting in the 50s when they were little kids and like that's a pretty big thing that it was left out of the whole case and i'm like well god so he's like a repeat experiencer you know like i never knew that so that was really cool to talk to his brothers and they're like they're like well he wasn't lying about this herbert was like an army guy like it ruined his life he changed his name for christ's sake so they said like on his deathbed you know he never changed his story like 
it made it, he became really religious afterwards. So that's kind of a famous case that I, I get excited about just because it's, a, you know, one that I loved as a kid, you know, because it was somewhat local. But, um, you know, and there's a lot of stuff online about Nebraska, a lot of like hauntings. We have a famous cemetery called Ball Cemetery. You know, I think Unsolved Mysteries did a show on that too. Um, but what I've been getting into lately is I've been going on kind of like these forums and typing in like, you know, Nebraska Bigfoot, because there is a huge Sasquatch scene here, which you wouldn't think in the middle of Nebraska. But um, in Eastern Nebraska, we have like, Nebraska has more miles of river than any state, you know, in the country. And there's your bit of trivia. for the There's your bit of trivia. Books. And uh, along the rivers, along the Missouri River, there has always been for years, tons of Bigfoot sightings. And on the Omaha Reservation, the, oh, there's a, an Omaha tribe called the Omaha Indians, which is in Macy, uh, Nebraska, which is about two hours away from Omaha. They actually give tours on the reservation to come see Sasquatch. But the thing is, it's not, they don't see it as like a flesh and blood thing. They're kind of more Josh Kutch and Timothy Renner, where they're like, no, this is like a spirit animal that comes out of a purple mist. Right, and they see right. orbs of light out there. They've seen little great. They report little green stick figures, mm -hmm. like all kinds of weird ass shit. And it's not terribly far away from Pine Ridge, which also is like kind of has the same stuff going on. Uh, is that Missouri? That is in South Dakota. I, I you know, I say okay, okay, okay. when I say it's not yeah. too far away, it's probably like three hours away actually. So that's you know, not it's not close, but. Along eastern Nebraska, going all the way up to the Niobrara, there is a ton of Bigfoot activity. But when it's described, it is so high strange. Like they're talking about orbs of light or the thing just disappeared before their eyes. And so to me, it's been super fascinating. And anyway, so I've been kind of combing these forums. And for about six months, I was going back and forth with this bow hunter and he had had this really dramatic Bigfoot sighting that like fucked him up. He stopped bow hunting for four years. He had been doing it since he was a kid. And I finally, like he's, and he's like, I don't ever want to go back out to where I saw this thing. I'll never do it ever. Finally, I convinced him, right? And I'm like, and like, I'm like, look, we'll go. We'll go during the day. Whenever you want to go, we'll just go for a little bit. I just want to see where it is, you know? So he, he goes, okay, but just know when you show up, I'm going to be armed. I'm like, uh, all right. <laughs> and so I show up and the dude's got, the first thing he asked me to do is like, look, my shoulder hurts. Can you help me put on my, my shoulder strap? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so like I'm with a perfect, like a, this dude I've never met in my life in the middle of a cornfield, like 20 minutes away from any kind of civilization. And he's got strapped with two pieces and he shows me, I mean, and I will say, um, I'll be honest really, really compelling structures, like wood structures, tree structures, like log. And like, first of all, the land he's showing me, it's owned by a farmer and he owns almost all the land in this area. So there's, t I mean, we're talking thousands of acres. Right. And so, yeah. yeah and, and this guy I'm going out with, he did not advertise this. I had to beg him for half a year to take me out there. There's no way he could just run out there and do all this stuff himself because I'm telling you, there was like logs and trees, like giant, like tree, like stump log. And it was actually really crazy. I have all the pictures on my uh, laptop. I should send them to you sometimes. And he, he put, so he put a trail camera out there and he got like orbs of light. And then the farmer who owns the land, he responded to an email and said like, for three, gen I'm the third generation who's owned this land. And we've had blue, blue balls of light going through the tree line for a hundred years. I'm like, wow. what? Wow. So, you know, and this is right where the guy had this Bigfoot sighting. And like, the thing is like, you know, he showed me some Bigfoot prints and like, I don't know at the end of the day, sure. Anyone can hoax anything, but I know people pretty well. And I absolutely believe this guy believes what he's telling me. Like, I don't think he's like trying to go to all this work to fool one person. Because it's not like he's going on Facebook or posting this to YouTube or trying to get any attention at all. He, he won't let me tell his name. Like, he has no reason to say this stuff because he has no one who's ever wanted to see it except for me. Right. Yeah, he's taking you to some some undisclosed location that's known to you and him. And yes. this, is, this is similar to what Renner does, too, with the Site 7 right. stuff. Nobody knows exactly where that is. Mm-hmm. You know. And and the thing is, like, I'm trying to get him to go back out there with me, and he won't. But what he has done is he's gotten me permission 
from the guy, the farmer who owns the land. And the farmer's like, I don't give a shit what you do. It's like, I will never notice you. I have thousands of acres. He's like, just yeah. start a fire. And I'm like, cool. So I'm, he's like, just call me before so I don't shoot you and think you're a trespasser. I'm like, that sounds good. <laughs> I'll definitely let you know. But I'm trying to convince a couple of my buddies here who really are, you know, they're not really into this shit. But I want to go camping out there. But I have to be honest, I'm too scared to do it by myself. Because it's like in the middle of the country dude like it is like my you know even like my google maps don't work out there like it's like no self-service at all and like so i feel like i'd have to have a, some backup so if you guys you guys are ever going through nebraska i'll make you camp out in the on the bigfoot property sounds hey, great i'm down <laughs> but I, I i've been doing kind of like a lot of like folksy research like this and then and what i've kind of discovered is i have like three librarians in three different towns trying to dig up materials for me Awesome. That I call these places or I call like historians from these small towns and I tell them, you know, I'm going, hey, I'm a writer from Omaha and I'm researching this. And they're so bored, they get so excited and become obsessed about this stuff too. They're like, oh my God, I actually know about this town. Did you also know this? And I'm like, so I'm kind of what I've been doing. And I've also been like cold. I've been like, in, sometimes in the afternoon, I'll get done with a writing session or putting myself on tape for an audition and I'll crack a beer, go outside my porch and I'll start cold calling park rangers. <laughs> just asking them say i'll tell them what i'm looking for or, you know like what i'm researching and i have gotten some very interesting responses from these park rangers i had one guy who is a game warden and i won't tell you from what region but uh he was telling me he had a bigfoot case in 2014 of someone who saw a bigfoot and he's like i he's like i used to laugh about that stuff and now i absolutely think there's something to it he's like i just don't know what it is but it's, he's like, it's really freaky. And he's like, he's like, you know, for, for a, a lot of us joke around about that stuff. He's like, but after a couple of beers, I'll, so many of us park rangers have had these things where we've gone out and looked at this stuff and are truly confused and baffled by what they find. So they'll find like fences like ripped up where people say like Bigfoot were stealing chickens and it'll be like shed, shed metal that is like twisted up. And they're like, what? How could that be? And there's like Bigfoot tracks around there. So... Either somebody's going through a lot of trouble to fake this stuff for no profit or no reason or no no to ready at all, or there's something going on, you know, like, and either way, I'm just having a ball looking into it, you know, like, because no one else is really doing it here. I actually emailed yeah. Matt, Matt Moneymaker from BFRO or the Bigfoot research. He was one of the finding Bigfoot dudes, right? And he, owns, right. he runs that, that Bigfoot website. And I was uh, asking him, because there's a couple of cases I was trying to like, um, uh, you know, track down and shag down their old cold cases. And I, you know, emailed him like, hey, you know, is there any, you know, local Nebraska researchers who, you know, I could talk to who I could, you know, ask some of these questions. And he was like, oh, there's not enough cases in Nebraska to warrant us having any researchers in the state. And I was like, oh, oh really? And I kind of like, <laughs> I took like an hour and started like writing all this stuff down. N never heard back from him. But uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I've, I've been really like shagging down a lot of these old cold cases. I'm work, I'm, I've been like uh, talking to a historian in Falls City, Nebraska. There's a great story. Um, and it was actually in a John Keel book. I think it was in uh, the Eighth Tower. But this guy saw this um, flying humanoid. But it was not like, a, it was such a weird high strange case that it was like this green looking demon thing with blue eyes but he had like old machinery on it. Was, there were like metal wings that he had like strapped to his shoulders. <laughs> and uh, like, it's the weirdest like case. A biomechanical and, thing. Yes. Like, like a biomechanical. And this happened in 1956. And like Ray Boucher, I don't know if you guys know who Ray Boucher yeah. is. Oh yeah. 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 He's, he's from Lincoln, Nebraska. And he right, actually, yeah, he's pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. And he had the, for, for, for like 20 years, him and these dudes had this thing called the Nebraska Fortean research center. And they went out and investigated all this shit. Like cops would like get these weird cases and they either A, didn't want to go out and look at them or B, didn't have time. And they would call these guys. Like they're like, hey, this like person says they have poltergeist in their house. You guys want to go check it out? And I'm like, whoa, how cool. So, but Ray Boucher did a, quite a bit of work into a lot of these cases. And um, this one included. And, you know, he thought it was pretty compelling, you know? Like, and he's a fairly grounded, I don't know him personally. Like, I've tried to reach out to him. I don't, he, for some reason, I think he thinks because he's like a pretty, uh, I don't know. He, I don't think he likes, he's like looked at my, my like social media. And I think for some reason, I, I, 
<laughs> I'm off putting to him. Oh. <laughs> so he, he, won't, he won't hit me back up, but uh, yeah, I mean, he I think he was I think he was a minister too, and at one point, a, Dr. Future um has had him had him on Future Quake. Yep, I actually listened to that Future ago. Quake episode yeah. a long time because I was you know, wanted to hear Ray talk. Yeah, that's a, I mean, and, and of course, that goes into all the you know, Nick, Dick Redford's final event stuff yep. and all that. Yep. Yeah. He was a big player. I mean, he was, elite. Absolutely. He was, he's the big player behind that man. But yeah, he, you know, he, you know, for better or worse, I don't, you know, know him personally at all. Uh, I would love to like get, get into his Nebraska files, but uh, yeah, he, he was kind of the researcher for years looking into all this kind of stuff, you know, and kind of through a John Keel lens, which is kind of fun too, that we would have kind of a researcher who actually like, looked at this stuff in a you know fairly intelligent way so not just like a mufon group you know what about uh what about cattle mutilations is that is that looked into yeah. anything that, like about that out there i mean i'm sure that yeah. that's, that's something that's definitely had to happen in nebraska yo there definitely is in fact there was a very famous one i think it was in the 80s early 90s that linda Moulton howe like wrote about incessantly called the jurgens ranch okay I've heard um, of that. yeah yeah and i've actually never read any of her books or her calculation books, especially, but um, that was a very famous case. Like, you know, that was like what kind of one of the big ones of that era. And I know there's been um, other cases, but there it's just, it's hard to find literature on it really. You know, like uh, I actually, I had a Chinese food with one of the, this guy who used to be a former director of MUFON in Nebraska. And he told me like, he's like, yeah, I, I looked into, especially in the nineties, quite a few cattle mutilation cases and crop circles. So there seems to be kind of just a culture among the, the farmers that doesn't want publicity. Yeah. Uh, probably, you know, isn't going to trust you even if you say, Oh no, yeah. I'll, I'll keep everything private, you know? So absolutely. And, he, and you know what, for a good reason, like, you yeah. know, it's like, I, I I can totally understand like you know they're I'm a business so, like who wants to buy some steak from this guy who's like had cows done right with, who knows I what would, to, some altered steaks yeah. yeah it's altered steaks a new Ken Russell movie <laughs> uh, um, well, that was David Perkins um, that was his oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. altered steaks yeah. that's incredible that's incredible um, I love the episodes you guys have done with him too he's great uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can, you can really see it. And it is kind of one of those things I'm very cognizant when I go to these towns or call the historians or librarians that I'm totally respectful. I'm, I'm kind of, and, and it is the truth. I've been sort of like, I'm just collecting stories about Nebraska, you know, ones that are, you know, old. We have like some, you know, we have like even, we have like a ton of airship stories. Mm. Like mm. John Keel talked about Nebraska a ton in the you know late 1800s and er, in early 1900s up until like 1903, there was actually a, an airship uh, sighting that like I think like 300 people in Omaha saw in 1903, I believe. But that was like in our Omaha World Herald paper and stuff. So yeah, I mean like we have a pretty long UFO history and you know tons of ghost stuff and ghost stuff is like I I like it but or you know like haunted stuff. I don't even know what to call it. Um, it's probably what I get into the least, but the thing is like when you want to go out and like look at this stuff and try to document it, it's so hard to go out and like find UFO stuff. Cause like you can't, you can't call on UFOs on demand. You can go to an area where well, unless, like, unless you're it, Stephen Greer. You look, can. I mean, Greer's got the goods, man. If I just had the gift he had to call him in, you know, <laughs> for like, what is it? Like $5,000. You can come be privy to the light show. And <laughs> yeah, right. Oh my God. That's a really cool thing, though, that you've got, you know, really digging into the Nebraska stuff, because some of these other states, you know, I would say Tennessee's included in that are like kind of burned over states already with all the paranormal investigation and right. the legends that everyone knows. Everyone knows about the Bell Witch and Eddie yeah. Jackson's ghost. And plus, and, we got the Civil War history. Yeah. Too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, guys, you, you guys have a lot and a lot of known stuff. And that is true. Like, that that's the thing. It's like. A lot of the stuff I'm discovering, I'm uh, I'm finding out that like not many people know about it. I talked to Greg Bishop, is a a really good friend of mine, and, and I kind of consider him like almost like a forty on a mentor. But we we have like little like conversations, over, you know, on Zoom now that I live in Omaha. We used to golf a lot together, but uh, you know, he was just always kind of like you know like the way to study this stuff, you know, and like in 
uh, even John Keel said, like, is to take a small microcosm and just really look at it. He's like, you don't necessarily have to like go to where the things are happening. He's like, there's yeah. stuff happening everywhere. Just really look and peel back and peel back and talk to more people and get more, you know. And and, and that that's what I kind of like a show like Hellier has sort of like taught me is that like there's weird stuff everywhere, and you'll go in looking for one thing. And then what you'll you'll have is like twenty other bigger questions, you know. Instead of finding out the answer to what you wanted, there, there's the you know like one kind of like thing I got excited about was the, um, that I mean there there's these weird synchronicities. <laughs> I, I mean I, I know it's like I'm starting to sound wooey, but like wooey, uh, but that has kind of happened with with like. I, when I called this game warden, for instance, I was telling you about who had looked into this 2014 Bigfoot case. I called he I called him and he answered the phone and I told him like what I was calling about. He goes, "Hold on, I'm going to stop you right there." Five minutes ago, I just got another report of a Bigfoot sighting in the same area, and I was like, oh, "Okay, wow, that's crazy." He goes, "I have not gotten a call about this about that case since 2014." Seven years later, he's like, what are the odds? And he was like, whoa, you know, like, but the, I, there was these weird patterns. Like when I went to uh, this this case that um, Ray Boucher was talking about, I went and kind of uh, investigated it for myself. And I, there's a ghost town uh, by Nebraska City. And there's a lot of weird stuff that's happened around Nebraska City. It's not terribly far from here. But I went to this ghost town where there was re- a, quite a few reports of a Sasquatch type creature in the 60s and a flying humanoid the same time that the Mothman Prophecies was going on. Or like, you know, um, that point, the Point Pleasant Mothman was going on. 67, there was a, around 66, yeah. 67. And yeah. the interesting thing is, geographically, there's so many simul- similarities. This hap- Where Myersville is situated, it's right by the Missouri River. The Point Pleasant was right by the Ohio River. There is a power plant right by this ghost town. There was a big power plant that came into play in Point Pleasant. And so I was like, whoa. And, 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 and like, I had never heard about that written. And I kind of stumbled upon that when I went and saw this power plant right next to the river where, where this kind of junk, you know, point pleasant stuff was happening. I was like, well, that's really interesting to me, at least, you know. So there, I'm, I'm kind of discovering all these little kind of like fun, fun little details that I've never heard written about. But when you go out and look for this stuff yourself, you're going to come upon more stuff. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's kind of like how the old, you know, adage like work begets work. It's like mm-hmm. when you go out and look at this stuff, more weird stuff will come up like that. And people have always said that stuff. It's like when you look at the phenomenon, you know, it'll look back at you. But like, right. I don't know if it's the phenomenon, but like I'm getting like this weird, weird, more weird stuff is happening to me the more I look into this stuff. And so to me, that's just really exciting, you know. Because you, I, for me, it's like I, I've been devouring books and like all this information my whole life. And now it's just, you know, gosh, you know, what, I think the last couple of years have taught me it's like, boy, I better not defer my dreams anymore. I better, <laughs> yeah. I better go do this stuff, man. Right. Yeah. If you're interested in this stuff, that boots on the ground kind of gonzo approach is the way to go. Cause like yep. you said, you're going to, it's going to take you another pass and you're trying to go from A to B, but you might have something completely different and even more fruitful you know that you wouldn't have found if you didn't actually get out there and look yeah and i think that goes back to our earlier discussion too about way maybe why uh the hollywood or whatever they don't feel like this could something like hellier could be uh successful in their model i think it's the non-linearity of that and uh, of the of that experience and it's like you know it's it, it doesn't there is no beginning middle and, and an end yeah Sometimes no it's just you're it's something exactly right. that just completely trails off yes yes and, and, and that, but see like to me that fits my sensibilities in such mm-hmm. a wonderful way because like right. we we're talking about like david lynch it can be done yeah yeah he, he like lynch makes non-linear movies that when you the credits are rolling you're like your mouth is the gate. You're like, what just happened? What does that mean? Can you explain Lost Highway to me? Well, I think, can someone explain Lost Highway to me? Well, what, what a Lynch movie is, he's just a surrealist painting, and there is endless ways of interpreting it. Just and that's why he the, ne- just enjoy the ride. That's- enjoy the ride. Enjoy looking at the painting. It, it's he's not following narrative structure. You know, he, that guy couldn't follow narrative structure of his life depend on it. And that's what's beautiful about it. 
And then for Diana, to me, it does not follow a narrative structure. No, it's it kind doesn't. of the whole thing. You know, whenever I hear somebody talk about a galactic federation or, you know, someone's abductee story sounds too organized or like neat and tidy, it becomes uninteresting to me. <laughs> You know, like, but when someone says, like, you know, I saw this, you know, 12, 12 foot tall bunny rabbit hop off a flying saucer, I'm like, tell me more. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, because, because the explanations of something and, and having it all explained and all put in a nice little wrap, that's religion. That's theology. That's not the event itself. Yep. No, you're totally right. You're totally right. Because anytime anybody thinks, Oh, no, I got this. I got it. I've got it completely figured out. I know what's going on. I can explain it. It's going to throw that rabbit out of the UFO to you. Don't trust that person. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I've, I've, uh, in the last couple of podcasts, I think I've mentioned this. And I, I, I just always mention, I feel like if I was to tell anyone, like a, the best book, in my opinion, to reread right now is Valet's Messengers of Deception. For a multitude of reasons, like that, that book speaks so much to present day. Like, it, it, there's, there's just a lot of like really prescient warnings in that, you know. Like, in like, if you go to a UFO Twitter, they're just following for all of them. Like, basically, that book was like a warning manual for people mm -hmm. on UFO Twitter. And he's like, "All right, guys, I tried to warn you. I tried to tell you." And not only that, it's like you know when when people tell you they know what it is or like they know what a ghost is like, Oh, it was mm -hmm. the presence of my little son who died in a car accident. I'm like, well, this phenomenon also has this wonderful history of being trickster and deceiving and deceptive. So it's like, you know, like when I talk and, and I like ghost hunters, I've like talked to a handful of them. Like, it's not like super for me. I'll go check on a haunted place for sure. But they're all like, you know, it's a spirit of a person who's like stuck between. I'm like, well, how do you know that? You yeah. know, like, you know, like that I kind of bothers me when anyone's got such a concrete, you know, it's almost, it's like, it's like the only people you can really have conversations with about this stuff are people who look at it agnostically. Yeah. Kind of sit on the fence. They're like, I think there's something to it. I just don't know what it is. You know, like. Yeah. The materialist paradigm fails, but then also any kind of rigid cosmology fails. Yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. I got to ask you, you now, we watched uh, a movie today, or I guess I don't know if Sergio watched it today. I watched it Not today. today. Uh, Skinwalker Ranch, co-directed by one, a guy named Steve Berg. I don't know if you know him or not, but uh, let's, uh, you know, I, what I, the, the main question that I really want to know, Steve, we're directing this movie, was what was it like working with Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite? Oh God, the best. Let me tell you, he's uh well, he's a legend first off. Like I was such a big real genius. With Did he not let you get the get the fun pack? No, yeah, no, dude, the guy would let you do anything. He's like he's like he's such not a Hollywood type of person. He's like the coolest dude ever he's just like a troubadour man you know like he travels around like with like kind of like young country bands and like you know eats spaghettios out of a can and like you know almost played pro baseball he's like that guy who's lived like ten thousand lives you know like and he's the coolest and i had done an indie movie with him what's well, so what is his real name is uh john grace john grace yeah yeah he was also in real. He was also in Real Genius. That's what I was talking about. Like he, he was. I mean, like Real Genius was my favorite movie as well, probably my favorite movie as a kid. And Lazlo Holly felt his character was so legendary. Um, but uh, I had done a movie, I think, like a year or two prior to doing the Skinwalker thing, and we had just got along great. You know, we were like we were stuck off in Utah for like five weeks, and so we just became really, you know, pretty good buddies. And like you know, we drink beers after work and stuff like that. And uh, so we had this part and I was like, oh my God, I got to see if John will do it. And he did it and, you know, agreed to do it for much below his quote. And he was just the best, you know, like it was great to have like a seasoned pro on set, you know, like he was really bringing it. So yeah, he's a super cool dude. Yeah. So this, this movie, um, I mean, you've, you've got pretty much basically all the 14 checklist on here. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it was a uh, an honest effort made, and it was, you know, I mean, like I haven't, I actually haven't seen the movie since it came out, which is probably like a decade ago. I have not watched it, um, but I had a blast doing it. It did not, like, obviously, like you know, it's like any art piece; it never turns out the way you exactly want it to. But um, 
it was a good learning experience. And like, you know, I, I, I did learn that trying to make a movie that, you know, it, you know, sits comfortably in the high strange world is super, super hard. <laughs> like, I don't know if I would do it again, to be honest. Like, I'm very interested in putting out like uh, TV or films having to do with the subject, but probably more in a documentary fashion where I, where I would just be like a producer or somebody or even like, you know, a host or something or whatever you want to call it. Because like trying to, do, to wrap a narrative structure that a movie audience can like with... 40 on it it's so hard because like we're talking about there's no real answer you know so yeah it's it's kind of an uphill battle man and i feel like it's probably for someone else to 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 accomplish and and be successful well what was your kind of like what was your experience like making the movie and like what did you learn like you, you told me it was like a learning experience like, it, what was like yeah the it, it wasn't so it wasn't so many ways like uh I kept on continually like writing myself out of scenes while we were doing it because I was so tired and like, you know, because I was, you know, co-directing it and I like wrote the story and I was like producing it and I was like one of the main, main, you know, actors in it and it became like too much, you know, like I was ex just exhausted. Right? I feel like it kind of affected my performance and like I would sometimes like I would be in a scene and, and like the morning of I'd be at breakfast like writing myself out of it and trying to make you know like I was like I just don't want to be in this <laughs> and, uh, and um, so it, but it, it was you know it was a great experience I really did have so much fun it was super fun to research uh, High Strange and try to put it into a narrative structure I had a lot of fun doing that the script we wrote and then what ended up on film were much different I kind of wish what we had would have stuck more to the script because it was a little more of a less horror movie more of kind of like a psychological thriller in the vein of like a poltergeist mm -hmm. um, but you know it turned out the way it did and it was I you know some people I know really really like dug it you know a lot of people I'm sure didn't but uh you just can't please everyone <laughs> right did anything strange happen on set oh god I wish I mean yeah, and, and the thing is, we were out in the middle of nowhere in Idaho, and which was it was a very Skinwalker Ranch type place. I mean, the closest town was Montpelier, and it was like six hundred people. The only restaurant was Subway for like you know, <laughs> for like hours. And I mean, so it was kind of weird because we felt like we had like you know the rest of the world melted melted away, and we were stuck. We were mostly shooting nights, so like you know, you sleep during the day. I was living this like super liminal life. Mm. for like six weeks i was like "Ooh, baby this is what is gonna happen i'm finally gonna get something because i don't know if i've mentioned this i've never had anything really strange happen to me even though i feel like i put myself into you know a lot of positions hopefully to try but nothing man like a lot of people say that but you know, they don't have that 14 understanding like you do so you can usually like find something you know well, what about but if with with your you know background and all of it, I mean, I guess that's a pretty pretty final. Yeah, well, you know, I should, I, you know, I there's definitely been weird, odd things, but I, I guess it's never. I've never had a confirmation experience that a lot of people have, where they're like, I definitely saw something, or I definitely felt something, something, you know, two two out of my five senses were definitely triggered by something. It's always been just kind of something like, huh, that's kind of weird. Did that happen? You know, it's never been like, <gasps> you know, where I guess I'm looking for that, like, kind of like Terrence McKenna being astonished to death, you know, <laughs> by <laughs> Fortiana. Well, I mean, you understand all the, you know, trickster framework from Hanson about it negating itself. You and betcha. Being elusive. So, yeah. I also wonder if, like, if there is, if the interaction with this stuff doesn't happen to people as much who are so open-minded already like it's this thing that like fucks with people who don't understand it or like it's not fun to fuck with someone who won't get it or yeah you know. i wonder that too you know like you hear different people kind of mention like oh it's you know and, and this is more of a metaphysical like way of looking at it i suppose but like it feeds off fear it feeds off whatever you know or like you know like it attacks adolescents because they're going through change blah blah maybe i'm so my eyes are so open to it like looking, looking, looking that like I'm, I'm a waste of time too. <laughs> to the guy. We can't really change this guy's mind or shock him. He wants this too much, you know, like, I don't know, you know, I do think that there is a natural though component to it. Cause I think some people are more true. prone 
gen- I mean, genetically probably. Yep. To having weird experiences happen. Yep. I mean, I mean, I'm kind of right there with you somewhat, Steve, because I mean, in my adult life, or really since I was, I mean, all of the things that I had happened to me were when I was a child, and since then I've had no really weird experiences that I can really say that are. Maybe just little synchronicities and things here yeah. or there, but not, but not like supernatural. Not something that is overtly supernatural. It, yeah, and I guess that's what I'm talking about. Like I have synchronicities that are shocking to me all the time. And and you know you know what's interesting? I was actually having this conversation with a friend. Do you feel like you yourself are having more synchronicities like in the last? Because like synchron the, the idea of synchronicities really has become pretty hip now. Like it's sure. you know. Five years ago, you almost had to be somebody who's into Carl Jung to like hear about synchronicities. But now everyone, I mean, not, it's not like mainstream, but it's definitely not like a, you know, like a, a thing you have to explain to people too much. You know, people, most people know what synchronicities are. And I feel like it's causing people to have more synchronicities once they learn what it is. And yeah, maybe that's the awareness of it. You yeah, know, right. Right. Because I feel like it's accelerating to where like I'm getting more and more every year that goes by. And maybe it's because I'm just noticing them more or looking for them more. But like, are you de- are you delving deeper into this material than you had before? Because that's the cl- the classic Robert Anton Wilson thing is like if you're interacting with anything that causes consciousness expansion, then the synchronicities are going to explode. I yeah in the last I mean I've in like when I say I've it's like I've never since I was probably like seven or eight years old I've never not been reading a book about this stuff like I may be reading another book you know along with it but I have there's never been a day that that goes by that I don't spend an hour looking into this stuff like it it is the most present thing in my life like you know Mm -hmm. uh and and um but the last like two since I've moved to Omaha and, and work has just been you know at a glacier going at a glacier pace. It's just been like I'll get a job and they'll call the job off because of COVID, and then it's like oh we're gonna move it from six months to now. I'm like okay, well, you know. So in the meantime, it's like I can't really go get another job because I'm like on calling away for auditions and whatnot. But I, a lot of times, all these days off, and since I've been going out and looking into the stuff, walking around these places it is creating a little more like weirdness in my life. Mm -hmm. So I would agree. Like, I think when you like delve into this stuff, even like, even like you get out there a little bit. And I think like, I think researching it and reading about it and watching stuff and listening to podcasts absolutely can like, um, you know, precipitate the phenomenon. But like, I think there's nothing like getting out there in physical space where even if like what you're going out to look for, is like a known hoax there's something that becomes sacred about these locations where these things happen you know even if it's like you know the george adamski well not many people believe that george adamski actually had these experiences but going out to like giant rock where he like supposedly saw this i've been out there and i get these weird feelings and it's because the narrative is so strong it's like a temple it is it exactly and so they become kind of these holy places to Fortians, where I think because we assign so much meaning to it, like they're, it's kind of like our church, it could actually make stuff happen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like, I think that's, you know, absolutely. I've said before too, I mean, and, and Renner, Timothy Renner really is um, responsible for this, you know, that there is that Bigfoot Museum in Big Ridge, Georgia, Blue Ridge, Georgia. I want to go there back. And yeah, and it's... Uh, you know the the when we were there, but that paramania in Georgia, we were talking to the, everybody was talking to the guy that owns it. And, you know, said, so, well, you know, they seen Bigfoot cross across the street and all this, and like all of a sudden, Bigfoot makes much more an appearance after the basically this like shrine, this like church to Bigfoot has opened up in that little town, and yeah, now people start seeing it. Yeah. Yep, it's like some kind of lightning rod, right? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that is there is a uh, this is so funny you said that there is a a big food museum in Hastings, Nebraska. I mean, like what? Right? People people like think Nebraska like Bigfoot. Nah, no. I mean, there's a fucking museum here, man. So it's like, but um, when Bigfoot they put, is incredibly popular right now. It is so popular, man. It's kind of the 40 du jour right now. Um, 
And to be honest, I always really liked Bigfoot, but until I, I actually credit uh, Timothy Renner and especially the books they wrote, I fucking love those books. I got so much more into Bigfoot when I started hearing Timothy Renner talk about Bigfoot. When I started hearing hearing people talk about like a paranormal aspect to Bigfoot or a kind of like a fairy aspect to Bigfoot, all of a sudden that locked me in. I'm like, ooh, Bigfoot's on the menu, baby. Like mm-hmm. the idea, because the idea of it just being some like kind of like missing link, like an, animal ape thing. I was always so like, boring. Ugh, I don't know. Ugh. It's almost like, you know, it's like, it's like a UFO being an alien from another planet. Mm-hmm. That is so boring to me now too. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and I think Adam, I think you once called, uh, where the footprint ends those two books, uh, the passport to Magonia of Bigfoot books. I think someone that's someone else's quote that we've requoted. Okay. Well, someone, yeah, but said I that. think Josh just says that. Like, Oh, well, that's, I don't know. That should someone be, can correct me. Sure. Well, it, it, I mean, th- yeah, that, that was actually like the pervert distillation of what those books are to me. Like, I love them. I think they're like canon to the Fortiana, like, you know, s- scene. There's some of the most it's, it's so much, some of the most exciting modern research has is honestly t- being done by Josh Kutchin. I think I think he's kind of like yeah he's one of the all stars to me. Like I absolutely he's a great writer even just aside from the the subject matter. But like man, I'm just so excited. There's a guy like him out there doing what he's doing. Yeah, and he's I guess he just finished his his latest. So the chapter I'm list looks batshit crazy too. I I, re- I just saw that today or yesterday, and I'm like oh my god, I just can't wait to read it. Yeah. I mean, those two guys are like at the, they're really a new, a new represent, I think a new guard of, of Fortiano where it's going that has a really like holistic approach. And, you know, the, um, they, they feel that they're encountering some resistance and I guess that's natural, you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, well, the thing is like, you know, it's like when, when you would look at the, UFO, Bigfoot, like ghost scene, whatever, all the, you know, all the paranormal stuff that we love. Um, when you look at it from like the mainstream point of view, it's as boring as it's ever been, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Like the disclosure, and it makes people look wacky and stupid because it's like you're you're looking for this monkey in the woods for your whole life. <laughs> yeah, and, dude, totally. But then there is like the Strange Realities Conference, right? And all the people you have, and that is to me where I'd always hoped this stuff would go. Like, Adam, you were nice enough to, I wasn't able to make it uh, to the conference this year, but Adam was nice enough to send me a link to all the lectures, and I devoured them, and they were fucking fantastic. It's a dream conference. Like, I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I will move heaven and earth to be there next year. Yeah, Thank you. Um, and here. I will also be pitching you my idea to give you a lecture about Nebraska high strangeness. Um, <laughs> but, um, guys, that first off, congratulations! It was so fucking good. Like, I mean, like, it was like really event viewing for me. Like, I, I, you know, sat down, like, had popcorn, watched it, took tons of notes. Like, I think Ray sure. Collier is another guy who I just like. Hang on, every word he says. You know, I think he's just one. I mean, like everyone. It was just like there was not a weak lecture in the whole thing, and like. It was just really well done, man. And so kudos to you guys. It, it, to me, it's like thank you. It's if I could put together like a dream. The only person you're missing is like you know like a uh, John Keel who you couldn't like you know resurrect from the dead. Yeah, maybe <laughs> you can get someone can, to channel him next. Time. You can get well. We, maybe you can do a hologram of him. You know, like Tupac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But no, truly, bravo! Like I, I love. I couldn't. I couldn't have been more thrilled about it. It was it, it just like it makes me thank feel you, so good that that stuff is out there, man. So. You guys are in, in, you know, I feel like the people you guys have in your show and the people you have in these things, that is what excites me. And it gives me so much hope about these topics for the future. Is that like, because like, while we're not like young, young people, we're not old either. We're, you know, we're like, you know, I don't know how exactly old you guys, I assume we're roughly all the same age, but um, we have a lot more years in this stuff. And I think like the way we all look at it, that is only going to grow. And even if it doesn't grow, that's fine with me. But as long as there is a core group of these people and you guys are putting on conferences like you do and people like Cutchin and Renner and Greg Bishop are writing books, I'm happy. That's all I need. You know, like I don't need the subject to get bigger or more valid for the mainstream. Like you folks, Twitter can have at it, man. As long as I have, you know, <laughs> you know, like a strange realities conference to go to once a year. 
Yeah. Well, that's but, the plan. Yeah, hell yeah. That's the plan. These things will still continue to impact the culture on a way broader level. Like Carl Abrahamson, he has a book called A Culture. It's more about the the occult and subcultural movements of like the past and how, you know, they're in this kind of like incubation stage when they're kind of at their peak, but the big influences really don't get seen till later. Yeah. That's true. And I think that, I, I, I mean, speaking of, I think like your, sh the show you guys do, and I'm not tr just trying to be like, you know, kissing your ass or anything. I, I genuinely believe this. And I think your show, and I think like, you know, where does the road go, Radio Mysterioso, Banal show. I think like a certain core group of these shows, they're all kind of related in their own way. Yeah. Um, are going to be looked at as serious research material in, de in the decades to come. I, I, I believe that because there actually is, it's full of thought experiments. It's full of new ideas and it really is the cutting edge of this stuff. It's kind of like the, the zine scene of now. It is in like, in, the, in like, in, in, in like, I, I hope you're like this whole movement and all the stuff you guys are part of is goes like gangbusters and dominates and takes over like the UFO Twitter stuff. But if it doesn't, that is okay too. You know, mm -hmm. like, because, like, what you guys are really putting out there is, like, really important. And th the thing is, like, I I've had this argument with people. I look at this stuff as just another kind of art. Like, I look at 40 on it not really as, like, historical subject or social. I just look at it as, like, another form of a an art movement. It's an art movement of ideas and, like, weird, surreal ideas. And I think you guys are at the forefront of that, that movement. And I think... Art is rarely appreciated when it's being done. Yeah. I mean, it can be a being a be appreciated while it's being done. I think you guys are definitely appreciated. But I think, you know, like a show like this and the material you guys have put out is going to be very important for people um, in the coming years. Well, we like to think of it as like a Smithsonian folkways kind of thing where we're – Yep. And we really make it a point to – document voices uh from the past that aren't as heard anymore and like try to get that on record and try to get you know their their latest takes on things like yeah, david perkins know. for instance yeah. you, you don't see david perkins on the the podcast scene people aren't asking him and he's a legend you know and we're losing legends every year you know so right. that's why it was so important for me to to get somebody like tim beckley on when I absolutely man and that's an important yeah. episode and like and uh, Tim Beckley, that was a guy who was in a microcosm in a time of some of the most interesting UFO shit. Him, Jim Mosley, Gray Barker, being tricksters, hoaxing John Keel. I mean, like, don't forget Greenfield. Don't forget <laughs> oh yeah, Green. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, exactly. Oh, dude, yeah, yeah. No kidding, the trickster. But like, I mean, like that crew. I would I would do anything to watch a documentary about like those guys and the, their friendship, you know, like it's like the Rat Pack. They were the Rat Pack but, of like the sixties UFOs, man. They but were but also there. also too, you know, like we've got guys like Brent Rains that you know maybe, maybe people don't don't know Brent as well as they might know Greenfield or Tim Beckley, but he's still very important and yeah, and still very very active, and um. You know, like it's it, it, and Peter Robbins is another one that's you know that I value, and so like I, I really feel like you know you gotta. That's I think that part of the problem, if you want to kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit with the UFO Twitter, is they don't look at some of these guys and they just think all this stuff started in a vacuum. It's like no, there's a whole history of these guys doing all this stuff way before you all came out. Oh, dude. They they stop. They, they go back to Richard Dolan. <laughs> you know that like it's yeah, like it, it, nothing it's like necessarily it's, wrong with Dolan. But there's yeah. nothing wrong. I like yeah. Dolan. I think he has. I think he has. But brought he has a lot his, to the table. He has his influences too. He know? does. It does. I just think like they. Yeah, you know, I got. I have no problem with that guy personally. I'm, seems like a lovely person, but like. But I totally understand what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? Like, it seems yeah. like they're like, well, you know, ufology started with him. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, no. I just don't, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. And like, to me, it's like when everyone's talking about the modern UFO stuff, they're talking about Nimitz and on. What about everything before? Like, what about Jacques Vallée's Forbidden Science books, one through four? Fucking read those. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, like, 
So, I mean, you know, like if, if the, if the government or the Pentagon started acknowledging like contactees and genuine UFO history from like the flap of 73, okay, then I might be starting to get interested. But as long as it's like, you know, ah, uh, there was like a blurb on a radar of the Tic Tac. I'm like, okay. You know, like I read the article in 2017, moving on. What more can I learn? I just don't like the idea of like waiting around for, um, senators to tell us <laughs> what's going right. on with Guardiana. I mean, it's never going to happen. We like tying it into like different subcultures. A lot of times like punk rock and, and ideas that like, um, you know, you had to like establish your cred and things and like, you can't, re you're not reinventing the wheel. You got to know who came before you. You do. And, and then with the levels of like a popular band versus like the underground cult favorite. I mean, we're not trying to be the, you know, mainstream. And so, you know, there's, it's not a monolithic thing. Like blink one, eight, two and black flag isn't the same fucking thing. Like, no. And I would much rather be at a black flag show than a blink one, eight, two show. Yeah. Yeah. Your so. punk rock culture analogy uh, is very, work, works for me very well because I, I came from like that punk rock, um, especially, I mean, I, you know, I had a black flag t-shirt when I was 13 years old, you know, I was that kid, you know, a lot me. of us do, I find. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you know, I, I, it, but it goes hand in hand because like, I find people who are, you know, not people who are interested in like mainstream ufology, those people aside, I guess people like, a, you know, maybe in our sphere yeah, are just interested in outsider culture, period. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Like if you're yeah. interested in Fortiana, well, you're probably going to be interested in like weird film or weird music, you know, like right. that, that was the thing when I met Greg Bishop, I felt like I had met my spirit animal because like him and I were like, he loves outside of music. I love outside of music. You know, we love like weird, obscure art and I love weird, obscure UFO stories. I mean, like, you know, it's, so it's like, yeah, I think, I think outsider stuff in general to me is just more rich and interesting. And I, I it's a, it just makes more sense to me, you know. Like, I think when you're trying to hit such a wide swath of the masses artistically, you're compromising the art, <laughs> you know, a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, like he mentions Black Flag. I'm, I'm really influenced by all that. But you know, of course, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm influenced by the indie rock scene of the '80s and the '90s and SST records and Discord oh, yeah. records. And, oh yeah. You know, so like. You know, when you're trying to put together, so this is something that we're, you know, we're, we're starting to get into is making uh, strange realities a much more kind of a multimedia type of thing, and yeah, like make good. it more of a, of a almost like its own. It's not a record label, obviously, but it's similar. Yeah, in that respect, that's kind of what we're we're going for the vibe, I guess. Dude, you know what? And I, it's funny when I think of the word integrity, I think of Ian MacKay. <laughs> McKay from you know Fugazi and, and like yep. Minor yep. that guy he, he has an open ended invite to come on conspiracy oh you god know. you know I would love to meet him and I also be so scared um because like I'd want him to like me and he probably wouldn't but uh you know like that guy like did it everything his way he did it from his little house in DC he never advertised in a major label his the shows were five dollars like that is the kind of like spirit I'm attracted to. So like, I don't know, like you guys have a, there's a very DIY thing you've, you've done, but it's become like, I mean, I don't know like your podcast numbers or whatever, but like, but like, this is a big podcast. Like people in this world know about it. You know, like it's yeah, very good. good. <laughs> you're doing, I'm sure you're doing great. You know, like it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. yeah. But I think good work gets out there. Good is good and people will find good. It just, you know, you have to be patient. Yeah. They respond totally. to it. Right. I mean, this, um, uh, we are coming up on episode 400. Wow. And, uh, you know, fairly soon in the next, sometime in the next six weeks, I got to calculate all that. But, you know, this March will be 10 years that I've done, been doing this. Um, I mean, well, I mean, he's been, Serfiel's been with me now for four years. So it's like, you know, we've been doing this for a long time and, and, uh, you know, it just, you put Ch your work in and you, 
you, know, you I, I feel like only now we're kind of starting to really reap the rewards for it a little bit. Well, know? good. I mean, but but that that stuff makes me so happy when like when you go into doing a project like this with the intentions of like, dude, this is gonna be like my full time job, but I'm gonna fucking kill it, man. YouTube ads. <laughs> All right, well maybe will, and good luck to you. But if you go into something where it's like, I want to do this because I want to talk to these people because they're so interesting to me, right? And I have this like you know childlike wonder about this stuff because you guys do. I mean, like, the thing is, like, you're, I, you know, and I won't mention any names, but I feel like it is a tough, it would be, I, I can't imagine doing 400 shows and keeping up the level of enthusiasm and interest. I know I could because I'm interested in this stuff, but you guys do it very well. We're like, it's like. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, but, but that's engaging. It's like, I, I can't stand a host who's not passionate. And you guys are definitely passionate. You're fucking brilliant when it comes to the history of this stuff. Like, both of you, you know, like. You know, I think I know a lot about this stuff. You guys know way more than I do. And, like, it's – I learned so much from the show. And it's just, like, good is good. And you guys have – you know, you're passionate about – I don't know what, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> like, just, like, talk you guys up. Like, but, it, like, it's uh, – it just shows. And, like, I, I as a person who, in, you know, until very recently have just been a consumer, I, I, I genuinely appreciate it. You know, like, it's so nice to have stuff that I like out there. <laughs> We appreciate you. It's all about the the audience, you know. Good. Well, I'm speaking for the audience, you know. I mean, maybe maybe uh, they're all being channeled through me. We we thank you. We love this. We love it, man. <laughs> thank you. And and I'm going to be a strange realities man. I'm going to be a presence there next year. Ooh, Dude, you got to. I'll keep those nights going late. Hey, you know, like uh, like I was saying. I mean, uh, yeah, next year is actually this year because I mean, pretty soon I'm going to start. Work, we're going to start working on the 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 speaker list oh so, my right? god how cool yeah i'm definitely I mean, coming look i'll i'll pitch you my what it what my lecture we'll do it off the air awesome okay it's red hot red hot all right <laughs> all right well steve awesome man this has been great you're gonna stick with us for a little patreon segment yep. i'm gonna read a couple of weird uh i guess news stories i guess you could call them news um so you guys uh, stay tuned for that in a couple days on the few days on the patreon but uh, yeah, like I said, we're gearing up for episode 400. We're still, Serviel and I are still trying to figure out how, what's going to happen. But where can people find uh, you, Steve, online and uh, see any of the things that you've done and all that? Yeah, you know, well, I mean, um, I'm not going to list my credits, but like, like, you know, if you're interested in like seeing like TV or movies I've been in, you can go to IMDb and, you know, I've done a decent amount of TV and movies, movie work, some good. Uh, or some good, some great, some terrible, you know, but <laughs> that's the life of a working actor. But um, uh, you can find me on social media at Bergmaster 5000. Mm -hmm. And I'll, <laughs> I'll, you know, I'll be, I'll be on Twitter interacting with Tim and all and John Tenney and those guys, you know. <laughs> yeah, all really good guys. By the way, do you know, have you, do you guys know who you, have you heard of UFO Defender on Twitter? Sounds familiar. Oh my God. It's the funniest thing. It's like this, like, Ag UFO aggregator that just spits out UFO like kind of like somewhat cogent nonsense. Oh, that's a yeah. Go rightly oh, okay. been tweeting those. Yeah, I, I'm, tweeting those. I actually have a theory that is go rightly doing it. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that it is. more than likely. In it, 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 I swear to God, it is the it, it's my favorite thing right now. To me, it's the best comedy out there right now. If you're into this stuff, UFO Defender. I'm gonna definitely give it a follow. I, I have I have seen it. I have seen it come up before. It is ridiculous, and it's such a fuck you to you <laughs> on Twitter, which is so wonderful. <laughs> what does it say? Have you seen something odd in the sky? It could be off-world vehicles. Let ancient aliens know. Yeah. Have you seen something odd in the sky? It could be undersea creatures. Let Linda Bolton Howe know. <laughs> yeah. There was one today about uh, you know about elder gods in the sky, and it, it just I started crying. <laughs> it, it made me so happy <laughs> all right awesome uh just um thank everybody uh thank you steve for coming on and being a part of this uh everyone check out our patreon where you yep. can listen to this patreon episode with steve and uh i think it ha it'll have a little bit of apocalyptic flavor seems we, like that's I, an overriding I, theme to it i think we'll just go ahead and announce and of course we'll, we'll make an announcement again but february 25th uh we are going to be having our first kind of like expanded hangout i guess is what we're calling it for for the moment but uh kiki dombrowski is going to be with us 
and uh, she is going to be uh, doing pretty much like a, a lecture and interactive kind of workshop and all kinds of different things. So come join us. That's uh, that you can become a ten dollar Patreon and uh, you can get into that. And we will actually. St- probably set that up on Eventbrite pretty soon. Sell tickets independently as well. Yeah. Sell tickets independently. If you don't want to become a patron. This is a strange realities live streaming event. Everybody. Yep. Yep. We'll be doing one of these once every month, probably except for when we do the conference, but from February on. So, all right. Okay, guys. Well, stay tuned. We'll be back uh, next week. Some more interesting stuff uh, on Conspiranormal. Please check out our YouTube channel, Conspiranormal Podcast.